It's just a pile of 17th century kitchen garbage, like many found along the shores of Chesapeake Bay. The colonists ate a lot of oysters and fish. What you got there? Bones from one fish are by far the most common among the oyster shells. Oh, cool. That's a, uh, a sheep's head jawbone. It's a tasty fish called a sheep's head, and it thrived in the diverse and productive habitat of an oyster reef. Ever wonder why you seldom see an oyster off by itself? Here's an animal that prefers company. Lots of company. But it's no party animal. Kind of a stiff, actually. In time, it may open up a bit, but it definitely doesn't get around. So, how then do oysters get together in the first place? How do they build a reef? Okay. Imagine it's springtime. Somewhere below the bay's surface, an especially eager male oyster senses the rising temperature and just right salinity. Suddenly, eons of evolution kick in and a few million oyster sperm start looking for love. Drifting through the reef, they set off nearby males while the females respond too, sending bursts of eggs into the mix. The spawn, like a chain reaction, sweeps through the reef. Somehow, sperm finds egg, and in no time, a brood of baby oysters begins life drifting on the tide. The larvae quickly develop organs, a protective shell, even a crude ability to move up and down. This vertical mobility is key. As they meander above the bottom, sometimes for miles, the larvae sense a chemical that oyster reefs emit. That's their signal to settle down. After just a couple of weeks or so of freedom, the lucky ones find, attach to, and start growing right on another oyster shell, stuck together for better or worse, for life. And that's how wild oysters make an oyster reef, oyster upon oyster, year after year, from the bottom up. Native Americans called it Chesapeake, Great Shellfish Bay. Clumped together, the higher density of oysters favored natural reproduction. Indeed, they thrived in the shallow, tide-swept edges, building up reefs, some so high the ebb tide left them dry. These were formidable, self-repairing structures that channeled currents and protected marshes from erosion. They stabilized bottom sediments, improving water clarity near light-sensitive grass beds. And the reefs were home to more than oysters. An entire ecosystem evolved, its creatures adapted to the dynamic conditions of an estuary, where the salty sea mixed with mighty sediment-laden rivers, where fresh water off the land brought life-giving organic particles to the reef, and from time to time smothered it in silt. Of course, this silt is what settles out to form the soft and flat bottom of the bay, a great place for worms that burrow down. But life has a way of expanding wherever it can, and so the oyster, the reef builder, adapted to this sediment-rich environment by going its own way. Up. An oyster reef, with its clean, hard surfaces and intricate three-dimensional structure, attracts a wide variety of life. Surrounded by flat bottom, the reef offers valuable cover to small fish like pipefish and juveniles of game species like Atlantic croaker. As adults, the croakers return to the reef looking for prey. But the scaleless, naked goby is a master of duck and cover, quite at home in the reef's nooks and crannies. So too are the feather blenny and the striped blenny, who always seem to be defending their territories. With its oyster reef camo, the skillet fish employs a built-in suction cup to hide upside down. All are true residents of the reef, laying their eggs in open shells, just big enough to squeeze into, but not so big as to tempt predators. One visitor, the northern puffer, eats soft-shell crabs, when threatened, it puffs up, hoping it looks too big to be swallowed. 
a staple in the diet of many fish, the common grass shrimp is considered a good indicator of reef health. And crabs of every size are here. This marsh crab dines on organic debris atop a large living oyster, and it finds an empty shell the perfect place to molt. The occasional blue crab, a formidable predator, might be found lurking in the shadows. Like the oyster toadfish and the eel, these are opportunists looking for an easy meal. There seems to be life and the struggle for life everywhere. Some 300 species of plants and animals depend on the reef and one another in an intricate web of life. Incredibly, the very foundation of this web is a group of plants quite invisible to the naked eye. Fueled by the sun and parading endlessly through the reef, phytoplankton, often called algae, are the primary food source for many of the reef's creatures. These so-called filter feeders have evolved highly specialized means of capturing suspended plankton. Among the tiniest of these filter feeders are the encrusting bryozoans. The animal itself is microscopic, but you can spot the strikingly geometric, coral-like homes they drape across oyster shells. Nearby, tiny mudworms and delicate sea anemones sweep up unseen plankton. The ordinary barnacle deploys an elegant fan to snare bits of organic matter out of the current. Clusters of hooked mussels are common on the reef. It's an efficient consumer of picoplankton, a type of algae too small for oysters to filter well. Like the oyster, it separates out what it wants for food, mostly algae, and eliminates the rest onto the reef. Food once again for small crabs, worms, and microbes below. But when it comes to sheer filtering power, the mighty oyster has no match. Mature and healthy, a single oyster can pump 50 gallons a day through its gills, removing not only algae, but sediment as well. As the first colonists arrived, oysters were so abundant, it's estimated they could filter a volume of water equal to the entire bay in just a few days. The reefs were living, self-sustaining water filtration facilities, teeming with filter feeders. They took in nutrient-rich bay water, used it to grow, and sent it back out cleaner. In effect, a check and balance on algae and suspended sediments in the bay. But as the human footprint on land grew, this delicate balance began to fail. Polluted with excess nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus in fertilizers, bay waters now grow too much algae, which eventually dies and decays, depleting the oxygen that other creatures need to survive. Loss of forest land and inadequate erosion control leave oyster beds silted over and oyster larvae with no place to set. And of course, we ate the oysters too. Now oyster abundance is but a fraction of historic levels when oysters could filter the entire bay in just a few days. The capacity of the few remaining reefs to improve water quality is greatly diminished. Repeatedly scraped bare from over-harvesting, few unprotected reefs rise from the bottom or support diverse communities of organisms. A vital organ of the bay ecosystem the wild oyster reef has been pushed to the brink. Perhaps the sheep's head is just collateral damage, but its disappearance from most of the bay shows just how interlocked the ecosystem is. Damage one part and you damage the whole. Without steps to save wild oysters, the entire Chesapeake region risks the permanent loss of not only the bay's iconic shellfish, but also a healthy bay, a healthy economy, and a healthy way of life.